All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the third and the last session of this uh, online Uber tutorial, Uberback tutorial. And uh, this session actually will be uh, about two hours long, okay, with a lot of uh, uh, detailed information. Uh, this tutorial is instructed by Dr. Marianne Beck and moderated by Professor Hans Fangor and uh, Dr. Ryan Pepper from Southampton University. Uh, if you are in Zoom and have any questions during the session, please send those questions as private messages to the moderators, Hans Fangor and uh, uh, or Ryan Pepper. Uh, both of them should be at the top of the participants list with the word moderators next to their names. Please do not send messages to all and please just randomly pick one of the moderators uh, to send your question. For people watching this on Twitch, uh, you can type questions in the chat box. You will have to register with Twitch in order to, do, to be able to do that, by the way. So without further ado, uh, Mario, please go ahead with the tutorial. Thank you, Shin. So Welcome to session three, which is the, the last session. As always, just very quickly, workshop repository, still on the same link. You scroll down a little bit and there is a binder button. You click on there and you can follow the tutorials if you haven't installed Ubermag on your machine. Now the plan for today is, as you can see, I made 19 tutorials. There is no way I can cover that in, in, in two hours. So my plan is to go through the first 10. And then the, 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 the other nine, you should be able to follow themselves. We covered most of those topics already. We just did them too quickly, I guess. So for more details, you just follow these tutorials and official documentation. And it should, it, it should be clear. Questions are still more than welcome. In live session, your questions to Ryan, and they will answer all those questions like previous times and the questions that are too specific and that are for me, I will answer them later. Uh, if any of your questions isn't answered, please raise an issue in the workshop repository. And once again, I would like to ask everybody to please do your best to raise issues in the GitHub repository instead of sending me emails directly because I get a little bit lost in those emails. And then it's, I think this week I was getting several dozens of emails each day. And then it takes me a lot of time to deal with each issue, se issue separately and all you should all you could have done is just go went through the issues and saw that i already replied to some of them so please keep raising those issues in the workshop repository for anything workshop related and in the last 15 20 minutes of the workshop i will go through some slides just to summarize everything and yeah make sure you know what to do from now and i think that's well yeah i think we can start now so the first thing I want to discuss is choosing a runner. Now, as, I, as during this workshop, because of the limitations due to Corona and, and quarantine, I have very limited access to GPU machines and I, my laptop is, doesn't have a GPU that can run Mumac. So that's why we're focusing on Oomph. But as we said, the interface is basically the same. And then very soon I'm going to make a, a YouTube video on how to set up Mumax and how to run it. But runner is something which is specific to Oomph, but can also be used in, in it can be also be useful for, for Mumax. So this is probably too Oomph specific. It's not that Mumax specific, but it can be useful. So, so far, uh, when I showed you how to install uh, how to install Ubermag, you install it using Miniconda. And when you install it using Miniconda, so when you run Conda install Ubermag, Oomph is installed as well. So we package Oomph as a Conda package. And when you install Ubermag, Oomph is a dependency of Ubermag as it, and, it is, it, and it is installed by default. And then you don't have to worry about setting up any environment variables or anything and teaching Ubermac how to find oomph because everything is done by default. Now, if you already have oomph for your machine or you can't for some reason use oomph because of, 
I don't know, whatever reason. Or most probably if you are on Windows and you saw that we use a lot of DMI during these tutorials just to make it nice and fancy. So oomph, uh, the built-in oomph extension for DMI is only CNV crystallographic class, so interfacial DMI, and it doesn't support periodic boundary conditions. And that's the reason of many people came back to me and told me, okay, Ubermag isn't running on my machine because of this and that. The reason that this is an oomph limitation, but we wrote our own extensions for different crystallographic classes for oomph. And when you install Ubermag on Mac and Linux, those extensions are already there and you don't have to worry at all. However, on Windows, we can't package those extensions. So you can't run DMI on Windows with periodic boundary conditions or crystallographic classes T and D2D. However, there is a way how to fix that and that's using Docker. And this is the main purpose of this, of this tutorial. So what is a Docker quick introduction is Docker is like a, a, a small Linux machine, which is on your machine. So you install Docker and then we create a Docker image, which lives somewhere in the cloud. And then when you run Ubermag, Ubermag first tries to figure out how is it's going to run the simulation. And then it's going to figure out, okay, he's on Windows and is using DMI. I can't run it on the oomph on Windows directly, so I have to run it inside Docker. So Ubermag is going to pull this small Docker image or Docker container from the cloud. It's going to create a small Linux machine. It's very lightweight. You don't see it. It's just, uh, it's just an environment for the software, basically. And then it's going to run the simulation inside that container, get the results, and then just destroy the container. And this is how it works. So as an example, I'm going to use, yeah, and one thing, Docker is you can install it on this link. It's free. The only issue is you need pseudo privileges. And I already got emails from a few of you. If you don't have administrative rights on Windows machines, then you can't install, I'm afraid. Yeah, but that's, that's Windows. We have to live with it. So uh, we import modules as we did before. I create a region. From that region, I create a mesh. The region is, as you can see, from minus 50 to 50, so 100 by 100 nanometers, thickness 10 nanometers. And here I want periodic boundary conditions in the x and y direction. Now from the system name I give here, you, you see I want to have a skirmion. Four energy terms, exchange, DMI, uniaxial anisotropy, and Zeeman. And here we initialize our system, as we discussed the last time. So minus one in a small cylinder inside the sample, plus one in the Z direction, of course, on the periphery. And then when we relax, we should expect to have a, uh, a skirmion. Now there are three types of runners. So up to this point, everything should be clear, I think. So nothing new here. This is where the new thing new things are, where the new things are. So by default, when you run this here, let me just make everything a little bit larger. When you run this here, so when you just say md.drive system like that, Ubermag is internally going to decide which runner to use, where is oomph and trying to figure out those things. Now, if you want to be specific how you want an oomph, then you need to create to create a runner object. There are three possible runner two three possible runner objects. One is called a TCL oomph runner. You create it like this. So you say micromagnetic calculator MC that we imported dot oomph dot TCL oomph runner, and then you pass as an argument oomph TCL variable, which is a string, and it's actually a path to the oomph TCL file on your machine. So if it lives somewhere, you, inst you installed it before and you want to use exactly that oomph version and you have it somewhere. So you just write a path to that TCL file, to that tickle file, and then it should be able to find it. Then there is an, uh, uh, the executable oomph runner, exe oomph runner. 
this is when you have an oomph executable on your machine. This is mostly for Mac and Linux. So if, if when you open your command prompt and you type oomph and then you get oomph opened, then you can use this one as well. And this is the, the last one. So this assumes you have Docker installed on your machine. It's very easy to install. You don't just download the file, next, 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 next. And it's installed and you can create this Docker runner and then you need to give an image. An image is Ubermag is the organization in the Docker cloud, in Docker Hub, and Oomph is a Docker image that you're going to use. So what happens when you have this, this image from the cloud is going to get pulled on your, to your machine, small container created and simulations run inside it. So let's say I created this Docker runner. I want to run simulations inside Docker. On my laptop, I have Docker installed. So here, when I create a minimization driver and I say md.drive system, I can say run it using this runner. And this Docker runner is the runner I created here. So when I run this, let me just make sure I run everything. When I run this, you can see now here that it's running oomph and in brackets you get which runner it's using. So this is a confirmation to you that it's actually running the running inside Docker. There is no big overhead. So if you're running inside Docker or you're running on your machine, there are no big differences in, in, in running times. However, the first time you run the simulation using Docker, it's going to take some time for the image to be pulled from the cloud. So when you run it, and then if it takes several minutes to run the first simulation, this is only the first time. Each next time you run it, Docker is already going to find that image on your machine and then it's, it, it, it should be fine. Yeah, so this is, this is a quick story on, 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 on Docker Runner. So if you're on Windows, you have troubles running uh, DMI extensions that we have, periodic boundary conditions and things like that, and you need to use oomph extensions we wrote, then my suggestion would be please install Docker and run it that way. Okay, now the next tutorial is multiple energy terms of the same class. So, so far we, when we made the, made when we were writing energy equations, each individual term was of, of different class, which means one was exchange, one was anisotropy, one was Zeeman, but we didn't have two Zeeman terms or we didn't have two um, Uniaxial anisotropy terms. And here I want to show you how to deal with those, how to have multiple terms of the same class. As an example, I start uh, with uh, one dimensional samples. You can see it's 20 nanometers long, composed of cubes, which are one by one by one nanometer. I create a region using that region and make a mesh. And then I visualize that mesh just to make sure that it makes sense. I'm happy with it. Yes, I am. So this is this discretization cell and everything is the, is the region. Now, let's say we want to have two Zeeman interactions, two Zeeman energy terms in our Hamiltonian. So we, one is going to be with applied field H1, which is in the Z direction. Another one is going to be H2, which is field applied in the X direction. So I create a system object, nothing new here. And now, please ignore these lines for now. This is just to make sure we catch an exception. So imagine we had only this. So I type system.energy equals mm.zeman with one field. Actually, I can put here, it's field one. Oops. It's uh, with field one that I defined earlier, and this is with field two. I defined earlier. And now I try to run this. I try to run this and I get an exception. The reason I get an exception is that you, we somehow have to distinguish between those two terms. Distinguishing between terms in Ubermag is the same for energy and dynamics terms and that means giving a name to the term. So if I had so if I have a term which is Zeeman term and it is mm dot Zeeman with h equals h1 
and I have that term now, so I can ask for the, for the name of that term. And when I ask for the name by default, the name of the term is the class name in lowercase. So that's by default. The reason we do that is that we, then you don't have to type each time when you define the name, when you define an energy term, you don't have to define, don't have to write names each time. So my Zeman term. So now if I change, if I pass the name when I define a term, then the name of that term changes. So in summary, if I want to have multiple terms of the same class, I have to distinguish them, make a distinction between them somehow. So I have to say MM Zeman with field H1 and then give a name to it, and then another term with Zeman 2. So now if I run this, it works. And yeah, small comment here. Uh, I'm initializing the system using a random state. And for that, I'm using this module random, which I imported in the beginning, import random. Now, if you want your notebook to be, so to say, reproducible, so you get eat the same result each time, then you have to set a seed. Because if you don't do that, each time you run the notebook, a different random state will be generated. So if you see today during tutorial, this random.seed, it means just we set the seed for the random numbers generator, and then each time we run the notebook, we should get the same, the same result. Uh, this thing here, I don't know if it's new, but this means basically give me three numbers which are random and in the range between minus one and one. Now system.m is field, value is m function, mm function is this one that we defined here. Maybe I should have put this to be point, but it doesn't matter. And now if I run the minimization driver, now we're minimizing with two Zeman fields. And if I plot it, I get something like this. So if you remember, I had the field applied in the Z and in the X direction as the sum, I get something which is in, just tilted in, in, in plane. And now what does that mean? If I ask for the table data, you can see here that the names I use when I defined the, the names I use when I define the, the energy terms are now here. So now I can see the energy of the Zeman one term and this is the energy of the Zeman two term. So the names you give there are, the, this is actually the reason why this is important because you have to somehow make a difference between these two columns. Okay, so this is how to have multiple energy terms main message is it is possible however it doesn't work like this you have to be specific and give different names to your energy term objects just to make sure that uber mac can know that can uh, identify them as different objects okay now let's go to the next tutorial next tutorial Lots of questions about RKKY. This is something I don't use personally in my research at all. But so if any parameters here don't make much sense, please, um, I mean, my apologies, but yeah, the con main concept is here. Same story, I import what I'm going to need because I'm going to, imp to initialize my magnetization as a random state, I import random and I set some seed just to make sure that it's, I get the same result each time I run the notebook. Uh, now as an example, we are going to build an exam a sample which looks like this. So it is um, 100 by 100 nanometers in the X and Y direction. And the thickness is 20, sorry, it's, uh, yeah, the thickness is 60 by 60. Oh, this was, this was my mistake. Okay, it doesn't matter much, but. Just to make it sure it's clear. Yeah, so we have three layers, top, bottom, and spacer. Top, bottom, and spacer, and the thickness of the top and the bottom layer are 10. So they span between zero and 10. And of the top layer is between 12 and 22. So they're 10 nanometers and the spacer is 
two nanometers. As before, two points, I create a region. Subregions is a dictionary with three keys as strings. Values are regions. And then I pass that dictionary to my, to my mesh as a subregions uh, argument. And then when I run this and plot, I get something like this. So this is our bottom layer, top layer, and this orange one is, 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 is the spacer. Now, we want to define our KKY interaction between the bottom and the top layer. More precisely, we want, let me zoom a little bit, we want this surface here to interact with that surface, this, this long, range inter long range exchange interaction. So how do we do that? So our system has three energy terms. It has exchange, nothing new. We saw that earlier. It has uniaxial anisotropy, nothing new there. And this is uh, the, by what I want to show you in this tutorial. So this is RKKY. So how do you define it? mm.rkky. You have to define two parameters, sigma one and sigma two. Here you can see I use a negative sigma, so I expect anti, anti ferromagnetic coupling. And then here you give two subregions. Now, internally, Ubermag is going to find those two subregions, find two nearest uh, mutually facing, two closest mutually facing uh, surfaces and do all the definitions it, it needs. So you just need to pass the two subregions you want. Now, this is something new probably. So, so far, when we, whenever we define uh, a value or uh, a norm, we used num numbers, so scalars or vectors, or we used functions. And I saw from some notebooks I was getting from you that you, you write functions for everything. So if you have a mesh, which is defined like this, so if you have regions and you just want to define different values per region, you don't, need to write, you don't need to write a function for that. You can just write a dictionary. So you can say, I want my norm to be a dictionary so that norm is MS in our case, of course. So that in bottom layer, it's eight, eight times 10 to the six in top is that and spacer is zero. So spacer is not magnetic. And this norm, this dictionary you pass here and then Ubermag knows what to do with, with the dictionary. The same is, this is true for any parameter. So if you in, in, in your mesh, if you define subregions, you can use dictionaries for anything, for exchange constants, for values, for anything. This is another trick here. I mentioned lambda functions, I think when I did this, a small Python tutorial, but when you, some people asked me about it in, in, uh, in emails, when you find in other tutorials, so, the story is if you have a function, which is, I don't know, my function, and then you have a point, and that should return, let's say, one, two, three. So you can write this function, and then you pass this function name to the field object. So here, instead of all this, you would just write my function. Now, one line, function would be this. So I get rid of return. I don't need the indentation. I put everything in, on the same line. I don't need the function name. I don't need those brackets. And I don't need this def. But I just need to tell Python how to interpret this. And I tell it it's lambda. So now this is my function. And now this I can copy instead of that. So whenever, whenever you see a lambda function, it's nothing fancy, it's just a single line function because we just want to use it once, we don't want to call it many times. So this is just some input argument and as in the previous example, this gives me three numbers, three random numbers in the range from minus one to one and this norm here is the dictionary we created earlier. So now if I plot my magnetization, you can see it, it's random and there is this empty spacer between the top and the bottom layer. I can have a look at the energy equation. Now, as you know, RKKY, we can't write in continuous form. 
so that's why we chose to write it like this. So there is, uh, there is exchange, there is uniaxial anisotropy, and there is this RKKY between top and between the bottom and the top layer. So now we can relax the system and plot it. And then you can see that because there is exchange, there is exchange in each individual layer. The magnetization in uni is uniform in, in, in each of them. But because this cell here interacts with that cell there, antiferromagnetically because of negative sigma, I get two layers with opposite magnetization. So this is how to, how to define RKKY. Now, if you have multiple RKKY terms, please remember to give a name for each of them. So this is something from the previous tutorial. Multiple terms, they must have different names. Otherwise, you get an error. Okay, now time-dependent fields. So some people asked me about dynamics, how they can drive the how they can get eigenmodes and extract dynamics. So we use time varying fields for that. Here I show you two time varying fields. And yeah, to start as usual, import the modules I'm going to use. Uh, the sample I'm going to have is the one dimensional chain of magnetic moments of cells, 20 nanometers long. Each cell is one nanometer by one by one. So if I plot the mesh, this is what I have. Now, if I want to define a sine wave, which is this, this is the equation which you think about, in, which, which is solved internally, so to say. So we have a field, which is like an amplitude. And then that field is multiplied by this sine function. So sine two pi f, F is a frequency, of course. T, you don't have control over. And T naught is something you can change. So to give some offset, so to shift, to, to introduce some phase shifts and to move it to the right or to the left. So I create the system object. The energy equation is exchange with this exchange parameter here, which is a scalar. And now this is new. So I have the Zeeman. This is the field I'm going to use. So this is this H amp, like the H amplitude, I call it here, but it's just the field which is multiplied by this sign. The wave I'm going to use is going to be sine. This determines the shape of this thing here. So this thing we can change by changing this wave. F is the frequency, this guy here, and T naught is this T naught, the shift here. So by having positive T naught, you're moving, moving everything to the right. By negative T naught, you're moving everything to the left. Very simple, just exchange in Zeeman. And for dynamics, we have precession and damping. You can see here, gamma naught, I'm using the one from micromagnetic model constants, so I don't have to type. And I use some very small alpha for some reason, but we're not interested in, 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 in physics really here. We're just interested in how to set up. And now because it's time varying, I must use time driver. So I can't use minimization driver if I have a, a, a time dependence of my energy equation. So I have to use time driver. So I'm going to drive my system for five nanoseconds and save the magnetization in 200 steps. So I let it run. Done, and now if I show the system table, in the system table, I have bz underscore Zeman, by underscore Zeman, and there is also bx, just it, it, it's, it's, it's removed to make it shorter. And so there are bx, by, and bz. And I can plot that, so I can say system table dot mpl. So from my system table, I want to plot and now if I did just that, I would get a mass. Everything from this table was going to be plotted. So I have to say explicitly what I want to plot. So I can say on the y-axis put bx, by, and bz. So if I plot it, 
I get here is a small legend, BX, BY, BZ. Now, why do they have different amplitudes? They have different amplitudes because if you remember here, I did that. So one, two, and three times 10 to the six. So this is how to have a sine wave. Now, another field I'm going to show you here is the, 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 the sync pulse or cardinal sine wave. So cardinal sine wave looks like this. So H amplitude is the same as we had before times sync 2p, 2 pi fc, uh, t minus t naught. Fc now is the cutoff frequency and t naught has the same meaning. Now you can say here, okay, but what happens if when t equals t naught, then this is zero and it's undefined. Internally, it's going to be one. So sine x over x for very small x is, is, is one. So you can't look at this strictly like this because the definition is much more complicated. So this equals that for t different from t naught and it's one if t equals t naught. So what do we need to pass? We need to pass the field, as we said before, we need to define the sync. We have to say it is a, it is a sync pulse. It is a sync pulse cutoff frequency. F is now as well and time shift. So everything is the same. Just this line changes here. Again, amplitude wave. It was sign like this. Now it's cardinal sign. F equals 10 to the nine, so one gigahertz, and it's F, it's not FC. I keep kept it F just for simplicity. If you want to change things, and T naught is the phase shift. So if I run this and wait for the simulation to complete, I can have a look at three columns from my data table, BX, BY, and BZ, and this is the cardinal sine wave. So cardinal sine waves you usually use when you want to excite all eigenmodes in your, in your system because cardinal sine waves have a nice flat frequency spectrum. Ideally, we would like to use the delta pulses, but we can't, so we use sync pulses. So you apply a sync pulse, you excited all eigenmodes equally. Let's say in your sample in certain frequency range, which you define by this FC and then you record the magnetization and then you can do Fourier transforms on it, et cetera. So this is how to define time dependent fields. Now there were questions about negative exchange constant. Negative exchange constant is, as we said, not really justified shouldn't be used. However, if you have two layers on top of each other and when you want to define a negative exchange coupling between those two layers, then you might want to use this. So how do we start? Import things as we did before. I set the seed because I'm going to use a random state. Uh, I'm going to use the random state similar to what we had before. So I have three three subregions, bottom, middle, and top. Here I call them R1, R2, R3. Each of them is 10 nanometer thick. So R1 goes from zero to 10, R2 goes from 10 to 20, and then R3 goes from 20 to 30. And yeah, now when I run this and I can plot my subregions and yeah, just what we expected. Now, we want to have exchange and here, so in our system energy, we, we have exchange because that's what the main topic of the tutorial is. And then we have the unilateral anisotropy and I added unilateral anisotropy just to make sure I, to set up some direction. And now this is the main thing here. From spatially varying parameters from the previous session, you remember that you can pass a dictionary Keys of the dictionary are the names of your subregions that you use when you define the mesh. So R1, R2, and R3, each of them have A as an exchange constant. What is this A? It's this number I define here in joules per meter. And now if I want to define cup to, if I want to define uh, cup uh, exchange energy constant between neighboring cells of different subregions, then I do this. So I say 
between region R1 and R2 use minus A and between R2 and R3 use minus A. And now I pass this A dictionary to here, A dictionary to exchange. I initialize the system as a random state, nothing new here, the same from all previous tutorials. And I run the simulation. And after some time, I get uh, three regions here. Now this is not very visible. So let me try to make everything a little bit larger. So you, we have this, so you can see the, bot, the, the R1 goes to the right, this one goes to the left, and that one goes to the right. Now, if you're asking why it is so colorful, why so many colors, it is because by default, this MPL function sets the, the boundaries itself. So it sets it to the minimum range. We can change that, and I'm going to show you in the next, next tutorials how to do that. So if you get something like this, it, it, it can be adjusted because of the numerical noise and M is in the range of 10 to the six. And you can see that it found it's in the range from minus 10 to 7.5. So yeah, something we're going to discuss a bit later. So this is the negative A constant. It's possible to do, I get to got a few questions about that. Now let's go to energy term computations. So, so far, what, what we were doing is that we set up the energy equation, dynamics equation, and then we drive the system. So using minimization driver or, or time driver, and then we look at the, the relaxed state. Sometimes what we need to do is we need to compute the, some energy term properties, like what is the energy, what is the energy density, or what is the, the effective field of, of some energy terms. So in here, I show you how to do that. We import what we need. This is all the same over and over again. I define the region. Region, as you can see, is, is a simple cube, 10 by 10 by 10 nanometers, and it has discretized 10 by 10 by 10 cells. I plot the mesh, and this is how it looks like. Small discretization cell, big is the region. Now we define the system object. The system object is, I give it some name. I define some constants. Maybe new thing here, I don't know if I mentioned, you probably saw mm.const. So far it is something which has lots of constants that you can use, so you don't have to define them yourself. And here I want the field of 0.1 Tesla. So I say 0.1 Tesla divided by mu naught. And yeah, zero, zero in the X, in the Y and the Z direction. Uniaxial anisotropy and uniaxial anisotropy axis. System energy, four terms, exchange, Zeeman, Zeeman and uniaxial anisotropy. If I show what is my energy equation, it's this, so four terms. Now I want to initialize my system. I initialize it in the zero, zero, one direction. For MS, I use eight times 10 to the five. It's a vector field dimension three mesh. I use the one I defined earlier. Uh, sorry. The shift of my laptop is dead and I keep using the same shift. So I have to muscle memory. Uh, yeah, so this is the, this is the, the initial magnetization. Now, the main function we use is called mc.compute. So mc is, if you remember, import umc as mc, and now dot compute. And I will, just to make it clear, so mc dot compute, or maybe before that, I have my system object, and in my system object, I have energy, which is the energy equation, dot tab, I have dmag, I have dense, uh, sorry, I have dmag, I have, exchange, uniaxial anisotropy, and Zeeman. But I also have these things here. I have effective field, I have another energy, and I have, and I have uh, density. So these three here. So let's say I want to compute an effective field for this. I can't call it like that. So I have to, I want to compute, so for the energy equation, so for the whole energy equation, all four terms, give me 
the sum of their effective fields. So I can see here, say mc.compute, compute that. Now, in Python, it is not very nice to do things like this when you're going to use attributes from this object here, which is on top. So that's why we decided to have it like this. So you say what you want to compute and for what system you want to compute. And now when you run this, you wait for everything to run. And then you can see as a result, you get the field object. Field object like magnetization, you can do with it whatever you want. And here is just an example. So this is the same thing. H effective, I want this. So this is the totally effective field. And then I want to use this H effective, cut it with a plane in the X direction, and then plot it using matplotlib. What do I do if I want to have individual energy terms? Same story. So system.energy dot and then you choose which one you want so we want exchange type dot and now you have here density effective field and energy so if i want to compute the effective field i do this i say mc dot compute this is not still good because i have to say comma and this is the effective field for my exchange and this is exactly what i have here so this is a exchange effective field now this exchange effective field i can ask for an average average is zero because exchange is very happy if you remember we initialized everything in zero zero one direction so exchange doesn't want to change anything that's why why effective field for exchange is zero here and the energy density same story, just instead of effective field, we use density. Nothing special. If you want to compute the energy, then the energy is just energy. And then you run it and you get the same thing. Now, if we relax the system and then we can compute the energy again. And now you can see that from 10 to the minus 19, it went down to 10 to the minus 20 order of magnitude and yeah so we reduce the energy we can show the relaxed magnetization we can compute again some terms but yeah here in the last cell maybe what is interesting here i'm computing the sum of all individual terms the things that can be new here so how to do summation i already showed you in the python tutorial so you set something to be zero before the for loop then you iterate through something here what is probably new is that system.energy is an iterable so lots of things in ubermag are iterables so you can just say term in for something in system.energy for something in system dot dynamics or for something in in mesh in field and lots of those things are already iterables so you can use them in, in in loops nicely and then i sum total energy for this in the, for each individual term uh, and here i compute the energy for the entire system and then i just print both of them and just to show you that it's basically the same if we sum them individually or we compute them all at the same time. Uh, yeah, if you're interested, there is a single line solution how to do this for loop in a single line, but that's maybe too many details. Yeah, the main story, mc.compute with two arguments. First argument is what you want to compute and the second argument is the system object you want to apply it to. Okay, now field operations. So we're now starting the main things of for data analysis and visualization. So field operations. So what are the fields? The fields are everything we have been working on with. So it's, uh, it's the magnetization field, the fields we use to set up spatially varying external fields, uh, effective field is a field. So lots of fields. 
And most of the time you will see you're actually spending with field operations because you need always to plot something, analyze, compute something with fields. So setting up the simulation is actually the easier part. The more difficult part is later to analyze everything and I mean, not to say easier, but it's more, more typing to analyze the, your data and visualize it nicely. Okay, so for our sample, I'm going to have a skirmion, just because we're all familiar with it so far and we don't care about actually the magnetization configuration itself. We, are worrying, we worry about uh, the operations and fields. So it's 100 by 100 nanometers, so from minus 50 to 50 in x and y direction. Thickness is 10 nanometers. I, I uh, discretize it with five times times the 555 nanometer cells, and I put periodic boundary conditions in x and y. I create the system object. I name it Skirmion. I have four energy terms. I have exchange DMI. DMI is crystal class C and V, uniaxial anisotropy, and Zeeman. I don't have DMAC here. It is, a, it is an interfacial DMI, very thin film, and people like to smuggle DMAC into uniaxial anisotropy. And for simplicity, I just leave the DMAC out. To, have, to get a skirmion, we need to initialize the system properly. We always initialize it the same way. So it's a function, takes argument here. I unpack the argument with x, y, and z. And here, if x squared plus y squared, is square root of all that, of course, is less than the radius I set up here. I set the magnetization to be minus one. On the periphery, I set it to be plus one. So the system M is the field. I use this M, M in it to define my value and norm is, is a scalar. So this is my system object. I create the minimization driver. I give it to my, I give system to the driver. And I run it and the last line here, I want to cut it with a plane perpendicular to the Z axis and plot it and we get the skirmion. And the skirmion we get, you can see it is a C and V crystallographic class because if I go from here to there, I go as a, as a nail domain wall. Now, first thing which is worth mentioning is, is that system.m, okay, if I, get rid of this, so you say this system.m and then I press tab. There are lots of things here. We already covered some of them. We can't cover them all because there are a lot of them, but the first one I want to mention is this array. And when you do this, you get a NumPy array. What does that mean? Everything NumPy can do, you can do here basically. So NumPy is, a, is, a, is installed by default when you install Ubermag. So have a look into NumPy. It's for linear algebra operations, Fourier transforms, lots of different things. So you can just expose this object M to NumPy by saying M.array. And now this is a NumPy array and then you can do all sorts of NumPy operations with this array. And this is one of the main benefits of using Ubermag is because you're basically exposing micromagnetic simulations to the Python ecosystem and you don't need to reinvent the wheel. So if, if you need something, the first thing you need to think about is that, okay, probably somebody already did that and it's already somewhere in Python and then you just Google it and you find it. So this is how we expose an object to NumPy. Now we can, M is a vector field, we can access individual components, X, Y, and Z. So if I do M.tab, at the end are X, Y, and Z. So if I ask for X component, I'm going to get another field, which is with dimension one. Again, this is all now a field. Everything I can do a field, I can do with this thing here. So now this, this, this is the field we had a look at. I can cut it with the plane and plot it using matplotlib. And this is, the, this is the field. Same thing for the Y component, same story for the Z component. And I can ask for an average. So system.m.average, it's a vector field. That's why the average of a vector field is a vector. I get a tuple with three numbers. Okay, now this system.m is actually this M here, capital M. 
So you can see here from the values, the Z, the Z component is, is, is pretty large. So this is this N here. If you want lowercase m, so you want a normalized magnetization, you say system.m.orientation. And this gives you an orientation field or a unit vector field or, yeah, maybe orientation is not the best name, but yeah, orientation field. If you do this, this gives you a field, which is again a three-dimensional field. So it's a vector field and then you can ask the average of that field and now you can see from the values that it is, it is reduced. So from this to that. To that. Okay. Uh, yeah. And so now we know what M is, that's system.m. Lowercase m is system.m.orientation and ms is the norm. And how do you get the norm? As an absolute value. So you can just say absolute value of system.m and you, when you run that you get the field which is, an, which is a norm. The same thing is this norm. So this is equivalent to using absolute value ABS. Okay. Now algebra operations. For simplicity, I define two fields. We don't care about what those fields are. Only thing we worry about now is that they are vector fields. So they're dimension three. And I put them to be uniform. It can be anything here really. So just for simplicity. So as we had a look before, we can ask for averages and we can do the summation. So I can do F1 plus F2. And this, as a result, gives me a new field, which is the sum of two individual fields. Now I can say the result of this field is that. And so the RES, the result is F1 plus F2. And then I can say dot average like this to know what is the average of the sum. But usually you can just put things in brackets like this. So F1 plus F2 in brackets, and then you call an average on this on the result of this operation here. This saves you a few lines. Minus the same story. Yeah, one thing I forgot to say. So for plus and minus, you can do only between scalar and, and scalar and scalar, vector and vector field. So if you can't do the sum between two in the two uh, between a vector and the scalar field. So you, then you will get an error. So if I tried F1 plus F plus some scalar field, I would get an error. Times operation. So now if you remember, F1 and F2 are vector fields. And if I try to do the multiplication, I get an error. And it tells me you cannot apply operator on DIM3 and DIM3 fields. The reason for that is that because in that, because yeah, we, we multiply vectors as dot products and cross products and not like this. So, but I can apply multiplication between a scalar field and a vector field. So if I just take an X component of F1, this is going to be a scalar field and I multiply with F2, then this works. Oh, my shift, yeah. Then this works. I can multiply two scalar fields, that also works. Another thing also, it works for constants. So you can say two times F1, for example. You can, two times F1 times times three, let's say. That also works. So it works for constants as well. Division, of course, two vector fields, if I, I try to divide them, I can't do that. However, I can divide vector field by scalar field. I cannot define the divide scalar by vector. I mean, this is all high school math, but worth mentioning probably. This is the power operator. So when I raise something to the power, it makes sense only for scalar fields. So if I try this on a vector field, I get an error. But if I try that on a, on, on a scalar field, it works. Compound operations, plus equals minus equals times equals divided equals is, it, 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 it works. So it's, it's, it's there if you want to use. Now the vector product. So two products, dot product and cross product. Dot product in Ubermag is 
this sign here. So it is at, so F1 at F2. And this gives me a, another field object. So this is a vector field, dot vector field gives me as a result a scalar field, so dimension one. Cross product, this is the symbol for cross product. So F1, of course, this is not a symbol for cross product, but this is how it's internally implemented. So it saves you a lot of from typing df dot cross and then calling this as a proper function F1 comma F2. So for that reason, I like to overload these operators and then it makes the equations nice and to make them look nice. So F1 cross F2 gives me a, another field with dimension three. Vector calculus, directional derivative. So you can choose, so you say F1, so this is our vector field dot derivative, and this is the direction in which you want to compute. So you want to compute DF over DX. If you want to compute over y, then it's that, z is that, of course. So this is the directional derivative gradient, works only on scalar fields. So if I try to do this, I get an error. You can't do that, so I have to apply it on scalar fields. Here I say f1.x just to have some scalar field. Divergence.div, it works only on vector fields. Curls.curl, only on vector fields. Laplace, it works both on scalar and vector fields. So this is the Laplace for, for, a, for a vector field and this is the Laplace for a scalar field. Okay, integrals. So if you have something and you want to integrate over the entire volume of your mesh, you say F1 dot volume integral. And this is basically this equation here. So it's going to take your field and integrate over the entire volume and yeah, with dv and surface integral. Not sure if this is really, I mean, this is not often used that, that often, but if you know the Skirmia number, you compute derivative. So it's integral of something dx dy. And this is how you compute a, a surface integral. So, but if you try to compute a surface integral like this, you will get an error because you need to define the surface. So it's a 3D sample and you want to compute a surface integral, you must say which surface. In Ubermag, as you've seen many times, we define surfaces as planes like this. And now it makes sense. Pipelines is you can do whatever you want. So you can say from field F1, from field F1, give me the X component. Now, this is the field. From that X component, compute a gradient. This gives me another field. Now from that gradient, give me the, the divergence. And from that divergence, give me the gradient again. And then from that gradient, give me the Y component. And then I want the gradient again. And then I want the curl, whatever. And then in the end, I want to compute the volume integral. So you can do whatever you want with this. As an example, this is something we did before, but I did it very quickly without this formal overview of all the operations there are. So the example is we want to implement the Skirmia number formula. So it's one over four pi integral of something dx dy. So the integral dx dy, it's a surface integral as we call it. One over four pi is just a constant. We don't care much about it. dm over dx and dm over uh, del m over del y are the, the directional derivatives. This thing here is a cross product, this is a dot product. And we know all the elements from before, how to do that. So first thing I need, I need a low, the lower, a lowercase m. So lowercase m, system.m.orientation. So this is lowercase m. Now, because we want to compute the surface integral, I need to define a surface. So I want to cut it like this, which is perpendicular to the z-axis. And now here, this is the whole story. So this is the directional derivative in the x direction, directional derivative in the y direction. This is a cross product between them. So this thing here, 
is this part here in brackets. Now I do dot product. This is the dot product with M and I get everything under an integral. I compute the surface integral of that and I divide by four pi. Pi it lives in math. It also, it is also in, uh, in, uh, in NumPy. And now this is our S and I print S and I get something which is close to one. Now you don't need to type this each time when you want to compute the Skirmia number. So you can just say M dot topological charge and it gives you the, it is basically the same formula. If you want a slightly more sophisticated method of computing spherical angles and triangulations, then there is this Baglusha method and you can use it and then you can see you get much better answers which are very, very close to, to integer values. Okay, so this was field operations. It's one hour since we started, so I should suggest we make a five minutes break. Uh, yes, so let's uh, take a five minutes uh, break and uh, we'll meet back at uh, 05. And uh, Maria, you can begin whenever you want. Okay, so let me share the screen again. Okay, so this was basics and now I want to go a little bit further and have a look at more operations. So I'm going to this field operations too. Now this is just to, there is nothing new really here in this notebook. It's just, it gives you how kind of nice overview of how to use operations to compute different fields and to, so to compute the individual energy terms, compare them with oomph and things like that. And in the end, we're going to implement our algorithm from the first week. As an example, sorry, shift key. As an example, we start from, we have an exactly the same thing. Now, I did this on purpose here. So as you can see, I have four energy terms. I have exchange, DMI, Zeman, Union Electron Anisotropy, maybe if I show you from the beginning, 100 by 100 nanometers sample, five nanometer thickness, one cell in the Z direction, so very thin, periodic in X and Y, I want a skirmion. So today, lots of skirmions, as an example. Four energy terms. Now, these lines in notebooks can get really long, and a few of, the, few of you emailed me about the errors you get when you try to break the line. So there are two ways how you can break a line in, 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 in Python. One way is you put not this, which means divide, but you put that and then you go to the next line. And then you say again, go to the next line, you say again, you go to the next line. So this is one way of doing it. However, what I like to do is I don't like to use these characters because it just it's difficult to get rid of them later, especially when you go to single line again. So I like to put everything in brackets. And then when everything is in brackets, then it doesn't matter where you break the line. The same story is with strings. So if you have a really long string, you just put it in brackets. We initialize it exactly the same we did before. System.m is the field with this initial state. We minimize it and this is what we get. So we get the skirmion. Magnetization, same story. System M is this guy here. System dot M dot orientation is that one here. Absolute value of system dot M is MS. So system dot M dot orientation is the lowercase m. I cut it with the plane, plot it. Now here is, yeah, let's not maybe. Maybe I can mention this. So this is scalar underscore C limit. It means what are the color limits for the scalar field in this plot? So if I say it's from minus 10 to 10, you can see that here it's going from minus 10 to 10 and everything is squeezed in this small range, my real value. So I don't get, I, I, I don't see it nicely. So if I make it like this, 
then I get everything is cut at the turn of everything above is not point one and minus not point one. But by default, you don't even need to specify that. It should be smart enough to, to do that. However, sometimes in, when you write a paper and you want to use a plot, it's nice to show that it goes from minus one to one so that people don't have to guess like, okay, where does it end? And that's the reason I, I put sometimes this in my plots because, because then you make sure it's from minus one to one. Okay. Now here a quick overview, very quickly. So the Zeman, maybe I can make this a little bit larger. You remember from the first session when we looked through the slides, there were lots of some formulas that you're all mostly familiar with. Energy density minus mu naught ms m dot h. How do you write it in discretized field? You write it like this. So minus mu naught times ms. So this is a number times a number times m is a field which we defined previous which is our magnetization dot product h okay now if i take this thing here and i put in brackets and i say dot volume integral i get a single number which is the energy the zeeman energy and what is the effective field for zeeman it is just h or just yeah just a single number here so here I just put quickly for each energy term how to write it. So this is minus mu naught. Mu naught is mm dot cons dot mu naught times ms times m dot h. And here I, for fun, I computed using oomph. So this is something we covered earlier. So system dot energy dot zeman dot density. So we're talking about the energy density for this system. And then in the end, I compare them. And there is the function called all close, which compares uh, this field with that field and makes sure they're all within so, some, uh, some, some tolerance. If I run this, I get it's, it's, it's true as we expect. So I won't, I'm not going to run through each of them. So this is the energy effective field, uniaxial anisotropy. This is the, we talked, we talked about the dot products in the presentation here. I put the cross product. I'm not going into details why here. So what we have, we have M cross U, which is M U sine and then squared. So M cross U is like this. M, this sine is a cross product. Then I need a norm of that field or the, the, the norm of the field. And then it's that's absolute value of that squared. This is the square times K. So this is the anisotropy. I take this, copy paste it here, put it in brackets dot volume integral. This is my volume integral. So the energy and the effective field is a little bit more complicated. So it's 2K over mu naught MS times M dot U and this is just normal u because this thing here is a dot product gives me a scalar field and then I multiply it with a, with a vector field. So this is just to give you, give you an idea in, in, in context how the operations we looked at before can be implemented here. And here I again comparisons. Same story here, everything is the same. The new thing here is that we have m dot Laplace m. So it's m dot and Laplace is just m dot Laplace. Everything else is the same. DMI, m dot curl m, which is exactly this here. So D times m dot curl m. So m is a vector, oops. M is a vector field. M dot curl is a vector field. I do a dot product and I get a scalar field and scalar field times D gives me another scalar field, which is energy density. Now, if I take that scalar field and I integrate over the entire volume, I get a single number. And the effective field is just, yeah, minus 2D over mu naught ms times curl of m. Yeah, again, you can, you can run this if you want. But now this is an exercise I, want to, I wanted to have a look at uh, for fun. 
So if we have, if you remember from the slides from the first session, this was the algorithm that I called oversimplify a micromagnetic calculator or micromagnetic simulator, just because it's really oversimplified. So things in reality are much more complicated, but here is just an idea. Now that we know all the operations with M, are we able to implement our own simulator somehow? So let's try to get the skirmian we just simulated in the beginning of this notebook, but without oomph. So we just use discretized field operations and this algorithm here to write the, our own time driver and to get the skirmian. So we start with some basics. This is copy paste from before. So I define the, the sample 100 by 100 nanometers in X and Y directions, five nanometers in the thickness direction. I define the region using that region. I define the mesh. Material parameters are these here. Uh, and I'm going to use set up some alpha. So I'm going to to uh, to implement the time the time driver. And I'm not going to use precession just to make everything faster. So I'm just going to use damping and initialize the system once somehow and then just use damping to, to, to relax it. Here I initialize the system the same way we did all the day, all day today. And now I'm going to define M. And just to, to keep things clear, I put up, to put uh, the uppercase M here with norm MS and I plot the initial state. So if I plot the initial state, this is my initial state. Okay, so it's, I'm plotting the Z component here only because we don't worry much about the, the rest here. So the middle is from us in the minus one direction, yellow is towards us in the plus one direction. Now these are the equations. So we introduced all these earlier. If you remember, effective field, let me just go quickly here. Effective field is the first variational derivative of energy density. So if I have energy density, which has exchange, anisotropy, Zeeman, and what else, and DMI, and I take variational derivative of that equation, I'm going to get this equation here. Okay. So as you see, effective field is basically just a function of M. So if I know the if I know M and I know all the parameters, our parameters are A, D, K, anisotropy X is U and external field H, I can compute H effective. And another thing, so this is our, it's not the energy equation, but let's call it effective field equation. And this is our time derivative of, of magnetization. As you can see, I only have the damping term here. So it's M cross M cross H effective, which tries to align M with H effective. And DMDT is a function of M and H effective. And I write those small functions here. So H effective function takes M as an input here. This is this M and this equation here, I just type using operations from discretized field. So this is the exchange. This is DMI. This is uh, inactual anisotropy. And just to make possible the summation of fields with a tuple, I put this just to be field. Okay, nothing, nothing special here. So you can see this is a uh, four lines or it can be on a single line how to write in effective field. DMDT, this equation here is that. So minus mm const dot, dot const dot gamma naught, this is gamma naught times alpha. Alpha, if you remember, I defined earlier over one, oh, one plus alpha squared times, and here is this three, two cross product, m cross, m cross h effective. So these are two functions. And now I will scroll back, sorry, here. So now we define our effective field that we define this guy here. We define, we, we know what M is, our initial state. We define how to compute DMDT. And now we need to do the time integration. How do we do the time integration? So we could compute DMDT at each step from effective field and M and we get DMDT. We multiply by some time step that we choose and we get delta M and we change magnetization M by that. 
And then we keep going until we say it's enough, until we reach the final, the final uh, time that we specified. So if we look at here, this is how we're going to do it. So the current magnetization plus the derivative. How do we compute the derivative? It's this function here, which takes m and h effective. And what is h effective? It's that function there times delta t, and delta t is some time step that we choose. And this is the solution here. So I want, this is some total time I want to simulate for. Maybe if I, for if I, uh, before we type this, in 100 steps. So this is my total time, total simulation time. I want it to be 100 picoseconds. I want to save the magnetization in, not to save, I want it to run it in, in 100 steps, so simple Euler integration. And dt is the time step, and time step is just this total time divided by how many time steps we have. And I have a simple for loop. So for i in range n, which means run these three lines n times. First line, we all know what it means. Lowercase m is just uppercase m dot orientation. So we get the normalized field. In the next step, I compute dm dt using the function that we defined here. And I need to give two arguments. I need to give lowercase m and I need h effective. And h effective is using that function here. So I know what dm dt is. I multiplied that by dt, which is delta t. So this is this guy here. And then I add that to m. So that's how, by how much I need to change. Now I get lowercase m. And now that lowercase m, I want to, multi, to put back to uppercase m. So I need to normalize this lowercase m with the norm that we used. So I say df field on the mesh we defined, dimension three, value m. This m is that guy here, ms. There is a, another way how to, how to condense all three lines into a single line, but I thought maybe it's, it, it's cool to have a single line, but then it's just overcomplicating maybe to, to explain. And I run this. Oh, I didn't. Oh, I need to get rid of this because we're not using oomph anymore. So we're just using the operations. And I run it and then we wait. And it's done. And now if I plot M, it's the one that we were updating all the time. And it is the same skirmian that we had. So this is not something that you should use in your simulations. Why not use oomph because it's much better and it's faster but this is just to give you an idea of how different operations that we just introduced the time in time derivative and then we connected things from the first session this algorithm and then you can see if you understand this thing here they basically understand the micromagnetics let's say okay so this was that exercise now, saving and reading fields. When you have a field object, you can save it. You can save it in three different formats. You can save it as a VTK file. VTK file is a very nice format for visualization using Paraview or MayaV. I'm not going to go into too much details here. Uh, you can save it as, a, as, a, as, a, as an OVF file. So it's a OOM format or you can save it as an HDF5 file. So as an example, we have a, a nanosphere, which is with a five nanometer radius, cell size is not 0.5 nanometers. I initialize it with some funny functions, so it looks like a vortex. Yeah, so yeah, I import discretized field, yeah, one thing to mention here so far, we're not importing micromagnetic model or we're not importing oomph, oomph C or anything. So we're just talking about discretized field. Okay, so it's, this is not related to oomph in the background or anything, it's just pure, pure Ubermag.
So this is our radius, this is the cell. Uh, yeah, I define the region. The norm function, which is just the sphere. Outside the sphere, I have zero. Inside the sphere, I have 10 to the six. Value function is just something which looks like a vertex. I define the field and I plot it, cut it in uh, perpendicular to Z and I plot it. And this is something which looks like a vertex. We're not going to relax it. We don't worry about it. We just need some kind of field. Writing fields. All you need to worry about is field dot write. And then in brackets as a parameter, you pass a file name to which you want to write. And then Ubermag is going to figure out automatically if you use dot VTK extension, it's going to write a VTK format file. If you pass o OMF extension, it's going to write so if you pass OVF, OMF, or OHF, it's going to save an OVF file format. Or if you pass H5, HDF5 extension, uh, then it's going to save uh, an HDF5 file, like here. But one by one, VTK file, VTK file name, I give some file name, and I pass that file name to field.write, and then this is going to write the file. Uh, OVF file, same story, just different extension, okay? And then write function figures out from extension automatically what it needs to do. Now, as you know, OVF file, there are many different uh, versions, formats. So if you say, by default, you save an ASCII file, so TXT file, so it's easy to open for everybody. But if you want to change the representation, you can just say comma, representation, and then, so, TXTs by default, you can change to bin four or you can change to bin eight. So if, let's say we want to save it as a binary eight, then it's like this. Or if you want to save it as an HDF5 file, HDF5 files are quite nice because they're, yeah, I can't go into much details, but yeah, I like HDF5 and it's something worth looking at. Reading files, all the files that you write, you can also read so you can here, the, how do you read it? You read it using a class method from file. So you say, this might be a little bit tricky to understand, but it's, it's beautiful from Python point of view. So you say, from discretized field, give me a field object, and then create this field object using this method from file. So this is called the class method in Python. So you say df.field.from file, and then here you give a file name. And this VTK file name, is I have to scroll back a little bit is this file here and if you remember we wrote that file using this cell so I can read the VTK file so and when I read that file I put that the, when I read the file into a field I put it into this field underscore read and then again cut it with the plane and plot it as a, using NPL and just to show us that it's basically the same field one warning here is that VTK file, when you read the VTK file, as you know, there are many different formats of VTK files. VTK file has to be written as a rectilinear grid. So it, you can't just read any file to, your, to, to, to make a field. So it's, it, this is a little bit limited, but at least all the files that you write, all the VTK files you write using Ubermag later, you can read them. Just if you lose all other files and you need to quickly read it, then you can still read them. But this is not something that you, can, you should use to store your data long term. So this is for visualization and this is a convenience function to make sure that you can read those files back. Uh, OVF file, same story. Now, if you, OVF file is the file name we defined earlier. And when you write OVF file, the representation and the version of, of, of OVF, so is it OVF1 or OVF2? And is it ASCII or it's binary, four or eight? It's going to be figured out automatically. So you just need to give a file name and then it's, it creates a field. And then you read it. And you'll be read it, put it into field read, and then we plot it, and then we get basically the same thing. Exactly the story for HDF file. So main story, three file formats, HDF5, OVF, and uh, VTK. All three files you can, re you can write and you can read back. VTK is something which is, which is great for visualization, but you shouldn't use for long-term storing of your data. 
you should pref I, I prefer HDF5 for that, or you can use OVF because it's nicely standardized. And yeah, that's it. One maybe thing here. So if let's say we have some file and then we want to convert that file to another file format. So if we have uh, an OVF file, which is somewhere on our disk, so some OVF file. So, and I need to convert that file. So if OVF file is some file dot OMF. Okay, so this is some file and I need to convert that file quickly to HDF5, let's say, or VTK. I can say uh, DF dot field from file and then I read this OVF file. Okay, now this is a field and I said, just say, and then write it to uh, some file dot HDF5. So this is how in Python you can convert from one file, one file type to another file type. And it works between all three combinations. Now, if you have multiple files, you just put this into a for loop and for loop does it for you. Or there is a function, there is a tool called OVF to VTK, which does all these things from the command line, but we really don't have much time to go through that many details. Yeah, but this, this, this can be useful, saving things, reading things back. Okay. Okay, then line. Line object is something I haven't mentioned much. We had a quick look at it, but here is just to introduce it more officially. So line object is uh, if you have a field and then you're not interested in the, in the entire field, you just want to sample the field along some line. So let's say you have a domain wall and you want to have a look at the domain wall profile or you have a, a, a vortex and you're just interested in how magnetization varies along the line. So sampling along the line, you, we, do with, uh, we do with line objects. So if, just to start with, I create some field. We don't worry about what the field is. I just need some field, okay? And I say field.line and then I need to give three arguments. The first two arguments, P1 and P2, are the points between which the line is. So you can see here I'm sampling between minus 10 in the x direction and plus 15 nanometers in so in the x direction and these are the same now you can choose any two points the only important thing is that though, though both points are actually inside the sample or at the boundary of the sample so if you have a point which is outside this the, the outside your mesh or your field you're going to get an error so i chose this thing here any two points in between work and then the third argument is the number of points on the line. So how many points you want to sample on that line. When I do this, I get a line object. Now I can ask for the date of the line object. And you can see we get some columns and some rows. The rows go from zero to 24. Why? Because we asked for 25 points. So then it's from zero to 24. So that's the rows. The columns, let's first look at PX, PY, PZ. Those are the coordinates of points on the line. So you can see here, we start from minus 10 nanometers. So minus one times 10 to the minus eight. And then we go all the way to 15 nanometers. 1.5 times 10 to the minus 8. Equally spaced, y and z coordinate are the z are zero along the along the entire line. So these are the coordinates px, py, pz, and vx, vy, and vz are the values of the field. So this is the x component of the field because our field is a vector field. If it was a scalar field, then we would just have one column here, but because it's a vector, we have three. So Vx, Vy, and Vz. And so at this point here, this is the value of the field. I think it's very easy to understand. And now this is the R thing here. Now here, we chose the, the point which is just along the X axis and then talking about the X coordinate makes sense here. But if you, let's say sample along the diagonal of some cube or something, so you 
choose some points in a weird way, then you want to know what is the distance on the line from the first point, if that makes sense. So this is the, so the, 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 the it always starts from zero. So zero is the first, uh, at the first element of our column and the last element is the length of the line, okay? So this is the data table. The dimension of the value, it's three because we sampled a vector field. The length of the line, it's 2.5 times 10 to the eight. And this is basically this, the last element of the column R. Number of points, line dot n. Now you can ask here, let's scroll back quickly. Px, py, pz, and vx stands for value x, value y, value z, okay? This is by default there, but you can change that using these two functions here. So if you can ask line.point columns, it gives you a list of columns which, are, which store the point coordinates. Or if you say line.value columns, it gives you the columns that store the, the values if you get lost. But you can rename them so you can just give, an, give another list to value columns and then you can rename those columns. So X val, Y val, Z val, maybe I should have called it MX, MY, and MZ. Uh, and now if I plot the, if I show the data again, now you can see we changed the column names. Okay, and now the plots, like all objects in Ubermag, object.mpl gives you a quick plot. On the horizontal axis, you get R column. So this is the, along the length of the, along the distance from the first point on the line. And here you get the, the value. Later, we're going to have a look how to change this. The axis, but by default you get value and you get the R with the, with the right unit here. And then we get a small legend with three lines, three, three columns we have. Now, you want to quickly change the size, you can pass fixed size. You want to limit the x-axis, so you don't want to show the, the entire range, you just want to show between five and 20 nanometers, there is x limit to change the limit on the x-axis. You don't want to show all three, you just want to show some of them, then you y-axis, and then you say a list of things you want to plot. You want to plot just one thing, then you have, oh, it's MX now, so if I changed it. I just want to plot MX and I want MY, whatever. By default, all three are plotted. And here, how to build a small interactive plot. Last time we talked about interactive plots. So I want to interactively change the range on the x-axis and I want to change, to have a list to select things I want to have on my, on my plot. So I don't know if it's worth doing it. Yeah, let's maybe quickly do it and then it's going to save us some time later. So this is uh, our default plot. Okay, it looks like that. Now I want to interactively change the X range here and I want to change the, 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 the I want to select what, what uh, columns I want, I want plotted. So I can say X limit is between, uh, let's say five nanometers and 20 nanometers. So if I do this, my plot is updated between five and 20. Now on the y-axis, I want to plot mx only, let's say. Now MPL is based on matplotlib. So anything matplotlib accepts, you can pass as well. So I can say, give me markers uh, to be that. So then I get those markers, then I can, you can change the, 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 the the, the width of the line, lots and lots of different things. You have a look at, 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 at Matplotlib. But now I want to change this and that interactively. So what do I need to do? I need to define a function. I call it my plot. I indent this line. I want to expose this X 
limit and I want to expose this. And I need to put them here as a list in, in my list of attributes. So by access like that. And now if I run this, nothing happens because I just defined the function. So I need to use interactive plots. So df.interact. And now in brackets, I say what x limit is going to be and what y axis is going to be. So I want x limit to be my line dot slider. Okay. And I want my y axis to be line dot selector. You can have a look at the, the API documentation and there you can see all the widgets there are for each object. So there are many different widgets for each object, but we just don't have time to go through everything, I, I'm afraid. So if I do this, we get something that looks like that. So I get two widgets, one is a slider. And if I change this range here, yeah, I will zoom this out a little bit so that we can Fit, fit the screen. And I should have done this long time ago, sorry. So, so we can here interactively change the range on the, on the Y axis. Now, if you remember from previous sessions, when I say when you do this and release, it keeps changing. So you can here say continuous update false. And then when you get the plot, nothing changes until you drop, okay? And here we want to show MX, MY, MZ, or if you want to show multiple things, you press command on your Mac, control on Windows machines, and then you get multiple things here. If you deselect all of them, you get a warning, okay? So at least one must be selected to, to plot something. Yeah, and this is what I basically did here. Okay, so this is the line plot and now we have time only to maybe go through one tutorial and I let you go through the rest of them uh, on your own. So quickly we can have at table interactive plots. This is very, very similar to line. Actually line and table are based on the same on the same abstract class. So all, most of the functionality there is for lines, there is for tables. So if you know the table well, you're going to know the line as well. As an example, I just have a macro spin. So one discretization cell initialized in the X direction and I, I apply the field H, which is in the Z direction. So, and then we use the time driver to relax it. So there shouldn't be anything new here. So I import three modules, some parameters, define the region, mesh, system object, set the energy equation, very simple, just Zeman. Dynamics is precession and damping. Yeah, so I get the, I drive my system and now in the system.table, this is something we had a look at before. Uh, we had a look before, maybe if I quickly go through. Yeah, I made a mistake. I should have gone through to table basics quickly. So this is exactly the same for a cell. System.table is a table object. And now if you say dot data, you're going to get pandas data frame. Now, if you remember when I said before, system.m.array, this gives you a NumPy array and anything you can do with NumPy, you can do with the magnetization. So Google a little bit about NumPy and you see what, what you can do with it in Python. Same story here, system.table.data is a pandas data frame. Have a look at pandas. It is a very powerful package for statistics, plotting, table data, lots of different things. So this is how you expose your object. So system table data, pandas, anything pandas can do, you can do in, in, in Uber Mac. Uh, you can ask for units and then you get, yeah, maybe quickly here. Rows from zero to 199, that's because we have 200 steps saved when we 
ran the, the time driver. Rows are everything that we managed to get from, from um. Uh, System.table.units, you get a dictionary, which gives you units for each column if you're not sure what the units are. So you can always ask for units. You can ask for data columns. So those are all the columns which are not time. You can ask for time columns. Like we were able to rename the columns in, uh, in, in lines, we can do the same thing here. And now if we ask what is the length of our table, it is basically going to be the time. So it's going to be, what is this? Uh, 10, it's not 0.1 nanosecond. Okay, and now in interactive plots, same story. So now how to plot system.table.mpl. But now if you see when I plot, I, it's not very informative because everything is plotted. So I can select things I want, Y axis. I can uh, build an interactive plot, my interactive plot, expose it. Uh, yeah, this is just going to more details and then this is it. So table, y-axis, y-axis, table, widget is the same, selector, you run it and then you can choose what you want to plot. So you can see as the time progressed, as we did the time integration, the energy was going down. And I want mx plotted, my and mz, let's say. Customizing, now like you can change, you can say the fixed size should be 10, five, let's say. So all the possible combinations of and arguments and anything that you can say here, marker is this. So this is something which is accepted by matplotlib. This is something which is defined by, from Ubermag. Something is exposed to widgets and we can also expose the axes. So anything you can build any plot you imagine, I think you can, you can plot it here. Uh, yeah, this is the same story basically. Okay, so I think we're done with, with, with tutorials. There are many left here. So we covered table basics and table interactive plots. There is a little bit more in visualization. And then the rest here is Maybe I can quickly show you one thing here. So matplotlib visualization is something we use a lot for papers. So when you want to show something in your, in your paper. Uh, so scalar field, uh, let's not worry much about it. You can go through this tutorial. It should be, it should be uh, easy to understand. One thing I want to show, uh, yes, it's this part here. So, so far we, we, when we do the plots, yeah, don't be scared about this. This is just, if you go through tutorial, it's, it's really easy. Uh, you can expose the axes of the plot. So you can import matplotlib. So you do it like this, dot pipe plot as PLT. And now you can create a figure object and then to that figure object, you can add axes. And then this axes object, you pass to MPL function or MPL scalar, MPL vector, with any, any, any MPL function. And then you have axes exposed. And then you can do lots of different things to those axes. You can change the, the font size, the, the, the labels, the title of the plot. So inside the plot, you change using passing additional arguments here and everything which is related to axes, you expose the axes, pass it to MPL function, and then you customize it. Okay, I think I should go now to my presentation so we can finish everything quickly. So I hope you see my presentation now. This was the plan for session three as we covered, but now the part I want to talk about is something that we probably, not probably, we could have done in the first session to give you an introduction what Ubermag is and 
whatever. But then if I, when we talk about this without showing you what Python is, what Jupyter is, what you can do, then it sounds too dry. And then it's, uh, yeah, then you fall asleep listening to this part. So here are some, 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 some things. So first thing is why did we choose Python for, for Ubermag? So the reason we did that is because Python is a modern programming language. And we believe it is easy to read and easy to learn. So from many different, uh, out of many different programming languages, Python is very, very nice to read and very understandable. It's increasingly popular in software engineering. And here in this plot here, you can see if you are familiar with Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow is like a discussion forum for people who do software engineering. And it is the, by far the most popular one. And when you Google for some question in Python or anything, you will see in the first, two, in most of the time, the first search result is from Stack Overflow. And this orange line here is the number of questions for Python. So you can see that in 2000, 2000 mid, mid 2018, it went over JavaScript. So we can't say it's the most popular one, but yeah, we can suggest it is probably the most popular programming language there is at the moment. Uh, and, but what we can say is that it is definitely the most popular one in computational and data science. So in computational and data science, people mostly use, use Python. It is well documented and well supported. If you have a question about it, simple Googling gives you an answer in 99.99%. .99%. So it's very well documented, lots of, lots of answers already there. It's an interpreted language, which helps us a lot. We don't have to compile. We can use it in Jupyter. This is the, 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 the website. And yeah, there is a, a, a book written by, by Hans. I forgot to put a link here. I just noticed. But you can find that link in the, in, on the, on the, so when you open, yeah, let me just quickly show you that. So if I go to back to my Chrome, and then when you open the index, the first session, you can find the link, link to it here. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, you know. Okay, so that's why we chose, why, why we chose Python. Now, another benefit of Python is this, there is already many, many things are already there. So when you, I got lots of emails and, and, and where people ask me during this workshop, how do I do this in Ubermag or how do I do that in Ubermag? And the first thing you should, you should think about is not how Ubermag does that, but how Python does that. Because Ubermag is exposed your micromagnetic simulations to Python. And now in Python, there is a whole ecosystem of different tools you can use. So if you want to use any, anything with arrays, there is NumPy for linear algebra, system.m.array, numerical analysis for integrating ODEs, for uh, uh, quadrature rules for lots of lots of different things, finding roots of equations and lots that's in SciPy. Matplotlib, we had a look at it, very powerful library for plots. Pandas, those are our tables that we had a look at. So you can expose system.table.data and then anything pandas can do, you can do. So there is no need to implement it in Ubermag as a separate function because pandas already deals with that. Scikit-learn, anything with machine learning, you can do. It's already there, it's available, you can use it. And Jupyter Notebook is what we use all the time. Now, another thing is you don't have to use Jupyter Notebooks at all, okay? I personally don't use them very much because I run things in the background. So you can just write Python scripts and run those Python scripts from the terminal. So Ubermag is simple Python, and it's not tied to Jupyter at all. So it's just like any, any other Python, Python, uh, Python package. 
So Jupyter Notebook we use just for nice convenience. Uh, and yeah, the main message, no need to reinvent the wheel. So when you think about, let's say you need Fourier transform, don't write your own Fourier transform functions. Just think where to find it. You're going to find them both in NumPy and SciPy. If you need anything with plotting, it's probably already in Matplotlib. If you need anything with data analysis statistic, it's probably already in Pandas. So don't write your own functions, just try what is already there because it's been there for a long time. It's well tested and millions of people use it. Jupyter, you know what it is. It's an executable document, lots of individual cells. We can change each cell. It can be a text. We can put equations, which are human readable. We have images. We can have put code and results, everything in a single document. We can have multiple runs of simulations. We can have the description of our problem as text in equations. We have code to simulate it. We get the results. We have the data analysis code and we get another set of results. Everything nicely commented. So when you run your, when you write your paper, all the simulations and everything you need to reproduce your results is basically saved in a single document. So if you want to tell somebody what you did to get those results, all you need to do is you just need to share your, your Jupyter notebook. That's why it's easily shared. And Jupyter Notebook, you can export as an HTML file, as LaTeX file, as PDF, lots of different formats. And this is why Jupyter Notebooks are great for reproducibility. Everything you need in a single document. It's hosted in the web browser and it can be run in the cloud. You saw the power of binder. And now if you imagine you write a paper and then you, your simulation, you put, you put your simulations in a single Jupyter Notebook. And then you put that notebook in a repository on GitHub, which is public, everybody can read it. And then you put the binder badge and whoever reads your paper can just click on the binder badge and run your simulations or analyze your, your data. So I plan making a YouTube video on how to do this and sometime, but yeah. So we know what Python is, what, yeah. But now what is UberMag? UberMag is just, it provides Python interface to OOMF and MUMEX for now. We have lots of plans what we want to do with it in the future, but we're not going to tell you those secrets yet. And yeah, and we expose micromagnetic simulations to Python scientific ecosystem. And we embed everything into Jupyter Notebook to make your life hopefully easier. And now quickly, why did we start with OOMF? We started with OOMF because it is most probably the, it's probably the most widely used micromagnetic simulation tool. You can see it's been developed by NIST, as you know, by Mike Donahue and Don Porter uh, since 1998, which means it's been there for a long time. And when code is there for a long time, it means it's good because it's been used a lot. It's been tested a lot. It's been maintained and we all have oomph. It's been cited many, many times. It's written in C++ and Tickle. It's a finite difference code. And it is very often used for comparison between codes. So when, when we develop our own code, then we like to compare our own results with, with OOMF just to make sure we're doing everything, everything right. Uh, yeah, one thing I forgot to say is that for some things that you cannot do with, 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 uh, with UberMag or with OOMF with MuMax, such as nudge the elastic band method to get energy barriers between different states, et cetera, et cetera. You can use some of our other simulation tools such as FinMag and FIDIMAG. FIDIMAG is our own. It's also, it's finite difference Python based tool. I didn't put those links up. Yeah, I will, I will show you that later, I promise. Okay, then UberMag documentation. Uh, two types of documentation. Each package has its own website for documentation. So if you need documentation for discretized field, you type, oops, you type discretized field dot read the docs dot IO. And on each website, you have two types of documentation. You have API reference and you have Jupyter notebooks as tutorials. So this is the further reference for anything you need. You can find there. I'm going to show you that in a second again. Uh, Documentation is available in the cloud. API reference covers 100% of functionality. So this is 100% up to date and everything there is, it's in API reference. 
tutorials as Jupyter Notebooks are there just to show different things in different con in, 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 in some context, but they don't cover 100% of functionality. Support, anything you want answered, any functionality requests, bug reports, or any general support, you raise a question, as we said many times. So far, we've been raising questions in the workshop repository, but we have a help repository. I'm going to show you that in a second. So for a few days more, I, you can raise issues in the workshop repository. We were going to have a look at those, but let's say in a week from now, then please start raising questions in the help repository. This is where all the people from the community that you, who use Uber Mag raise issues. So then please raise issues there. We like issues because it's a permanent record of communication. We know what we said to whom, who asked what, is the problem resolved? And it also gives a chance, there is a chance somebody already asked the question, so it's a nice thing. Everything is public, which means anybody can open the repository and read all questions and all the answers. They don't need a GitHub account, so don't put paper drafts as attachments to issues or any, give us your credit card details. And one thing which is also very important to mention is that when you ask a question, so UberMag is a, an open source software and we are busy as most as, as you as, as most of you are and we also need to do our write our physics papers and lots of different things and develop software and maintain it so we are not a company so I know some people are used when you ask a question you get an answer within an hour or two and then we notice that some people, when they ask a question, they expect an, an answer immediately. So if you don't get an answer within a few days, it's very normal. It's a small team, so please be patient. Okay, so it's not... Okay, license. It's a BSD3 clause license, which is probably the best there is in terms of codes. You can do with the code whatever you want. So you can use it for any purpose you want. You can change it, you can modify it, you can clone it to your own repository, to, you can fork it, you can do whatever you want with it. However, you have two obligations. First obligation is you have to cite. So whenever you use UberMag, you have to cite. Or if you want to write your own code, which is based on UberMag, you must cite it and keep the license file there as it is. So do whatever you want you just always have to say where the code comes from okay now before i go to those last questions as i said i will, will quickly go to to my chrome and i promise we'll, we will be done in five minutes i'm over time again uh sorry i lost it somewhere oh here it is so we are in Chrome now, and now in Chrome, if I go to github.com.ubermag workshop. So this is the workshop repository. This workshop repository is going to stay the same until we schedule a new workshop. Then the materials and everything, all the information is going to change. However, before we start changing this repository, we're going to make a snapshot. And then here on the right hand side, you're going to see the releases. And then this is our previous workshop was in April and May this year. And then when people click on this, they get a zip file downloaded with all the files that were, that were looked like that at the end of that workshop. So when we start a new workshop, we create a release and there is going to be a workshop, I don't know, June, July, 2020. You click on that and you get all the materials there were at that time. So that's one thing I wanted to show you. Another thing is I mentioned FIDIMAG. So FIDIMAG is our, another finite difference tool, which is not based on OOMF or, or UMAX. It's, 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 it's tool on its own. So if there is something you can't be known, you might probably be able to do in Have a look into that. There is also 
FinMag. FinMag is our finite elements tool. It's much more complicated. You can have a look at it. Uh, oh, again, it's not based on any other tool. It's both tools are, py are Python based. So you can have a look into that. Another thing I wanted to show you is if I go to discretized field .read -docs .io, I get the documentation website. The documentation website, you can see there is API reference. And in the API reference, I can choose, let's say, field. And this is a very, very long page. And you can see everything you can do with it. So for each function there is, you can find a relational, relational operator. And then you can how to use it, what are the parameters, what does it return, and some small examples how to use it. Okay. So each function in UberMac has this. And this is always up to date. And it's well tested. And then we also have tutorials. As I said, tutorials are small, small Jupyter notebooks that I showed you, but they are rendered here. So you can go through these tutorials. If we haven't covered anything during uh, something during the workshop, you can probably find here. Okay, that was another thing. And one thing more I wanted to show you is, is the, uh, the, yes, the help repository. So workshop issues, that's where we've been raising issues so far. Now, if you go to UberMag organization, you can see there are lots of individual repositories, but there is one which is called help. And then in the help repositories, you can raise issues here. This is our main repository where everybody who uses UberMag raises issues. We kept issues separate for the workshop just to don't bombard everybody subscribe to this help with all the questions but yeah when you when we're done with the workshop please start raising your issues here okay now i can go to the last few slides so we said the license and now there are three things we ask you so one thing is please cite the software it's very important that you give credit to the software you use. You have to understand that we are physicists as well. We have to write our physics papers as well, but we also do some software. And with software, it's difficult to write papers and get citations. So at least, you know, help us a little bit by citing some of our software when you use it. Uh, you can contribute to UberMag and do our survey. So one first thing, First thing, support the software, cite it. You cite it like this, with this paper at the moment. And then, very important, if you use oomph in the background, you cite oomph. If you use mumex, you cite mumex. So if you cite only us, but you use one of these two in the background, that's not good. So you please cite at least two. So us and the, 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 the two in the background. That's very important. Please contribute we welcome all types of contributions. So anything that comes to your mind that you can help with writing extensions, writing documentation, uh, making some tutorials, interesting use cases, making YouTube videos. If you find a bug, please don't keep it to yourself. Tell us there is a bug and then we try to fix it. If you find a bug and you know how to fix it, then try to fix it yourself. If you, are in some repository and then you see that somebody is asking some question that you know an answer to, please reply to it. Even if you find some typos and grammar mistakes, please try to contribute. We don't have time to cover how to contribute through GitHub, but yeah, you can Google a little bit how to fork a repository and make a pull request. But if there is anything you want to contribute to, but you don't know how, you don't know how to start, that's perfectly fine, just let us know. And then, then we are going to help you, help you start. It's very important we'll, that if you need something from UberMag and it's not already there, let us know. We can try to implement it for you. The whole idea is that UberMag is, is a nice convenient tool for everybody and more we use it and more we complain about it, the, more, the, the, the better it gets. So if you find something which doesn't make sense or you have some function name which is not named right, with, which confuses you, let us know and then we, 
we welcome that feedback and we want to change those things because we want Ubermag to, to be nice and simple to use. So anything com which confuses you, let us know, we fix it. Survey, very important thing. This is as important as the citations. So we ask all of you to complete our survey. In the survey, we're not going to ask you for any personal information. Actually we are, but you don't have to answer. And all the questions are optional. So you don't be, don't be scared that you have to give us your email or your name that we're going to bombard you with emails. We just need some statistics. Organizers, so Kirill and Shin are going to send you a link by email uh, early next week. And we are going to put the link on in the workshop repository. So when you get an email about the survey, please don't ignore it, complete it. We really need it because based on those answers, we know what to do with Ubermac, how to improve it and how to plan our, our activities. Okay, that's all I planned. Thank you very much. Any questions unanswered? Let me just quickly have a look. Yeah, is it possible to track the progress of simulation as it's running to tell how close it, to, it is to finishing? Not at the moment. This is something which is theoretically possible and it was available a little bit in, 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 in Joomf before, but it is very fragile on Windows and something. So that's why we decided to remove it, but it is, yeah, it's not available and I'm not sure we are going to make it available really because it's, yeah, so that was the question. Good. Any further questions, raise issues in the workshop repository. And yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. I just want to thank you again. And I want to thank Hans and Ryan for uh, helping uh, uh, moderating this uh, whole session. I believe many people would uh, benefit from this uh, tutorial. Um, so that uh, actually, um, I, I do have one question. Uh, you said that the uh, after the workshop is uh, ended uh, for after a couple of uh, uh, days, the 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 workshop material can be downloaded as a zip file. I just wonder whether all the issues or the questions raised will there be will that those be transferred to another place uh, to the like uh, the, uh, the the help? No, so all the all the issues and all the questions are going to be there forever in the repository. So, so it's we, gonna don't be we don't delete them. Just the files from the repository, you can download as a single zip file. So it's like a snapshot how the, what the repository was at the end of the workshop. I see. Yeah. I see. But issues and everything is going to be there forever. We don't delete it and we don't move it anywhere else. I see. I see. Yeah. Thank you.